So in the beginning, the way that God made everything was perfect. It's all an act of his grace. In fact, everything was good. Everything was beautiful. Everything is pure. Everything is right. They're able to eat of anything they want to. In fact, it is such a gracious environment that the only thing that is off limits is one tree. Only one tree. How great would it be today if you're like, you know what? All I got to do is not eat of that tree and I'm good. Is that how we operate today? No. In fact, it was so nice when we looked at this, Genesis chapter 2, 25, says they were naked and not ashamed, right? But remember what that word means. Did they have clothes on? No, they didn't physically have clothes on, but did they have some sort of covering, some sort of glory? See, it's clicking for everybody now. Everybody's like, I think you got problems, and then everybody's like, oh, okay. And so all you need is just a little enticement. All you need is just a little bait. I mean, that's how we get fish, right? See, Satan's the original fisherman. He knows how to get them. And what's amazing is as they reason about it and they consider, man, this, something about this fruit just, woo, I don't know. Got to have it. And it says when they ate into it, their eyes were what? Open. And what did they see? Themselves. And the word naked changes, doesn't it? It means, and I'm not for sure what lexicon this is in, but as a jaybird. <laughs> right? That's what it means. But here's a question. How did God see it? Have you ever thought about whenever they ate and all of a sudden what they could see in themselves, in one another, what did God see? Sin. I wonder what that looks like. I tried to come up with a depiction. Hopefully it's silly enough and dramatic enough to where you'll remember it. But if you think about that their righteousness is removed and they lose it, is this how God sees them? Does now God see them in such a way as to where immediate friction is caused? And this is where we dive into our scriptures. So if you take your Bible, and we're going to hit verse 7 just so that we have a good little pickup. Chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And what is the response to this newfound knowledge? Here's the thing. Could they have existed without knowing this? They were doing just fine, weren't they? In fact, we have the seven days of creation, but God never gives us a time period of how long they existed before this event took place. It could have been months. It could have been years. It could have been minutes. We don't know. But notice what their reaction is. And they did what? No, not yet. What's it say? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Adam and Eve are experiencing something they've never experienced before. Shame. Fear, panic. When's the last time you panicked over something? Not what somebody wrote about you on Facebook. When's the last time you really panicked about something? And so notice what they do is they scrape for the nearest available thing. Does this cover your sin? No, there's a lot showing. It'll never do the job. It is insufficient covering. So not only do they cover their nakedness, get this, okay? But look what verse 8 says. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. How had their reaction been to this every time before? Welcoming? Yeah. Was there anything strange about this? 
No. Do you think they would have been excited to see the Lord? What happened? What did God change? Anything? God didn't change anything, but it's their guilt. Man, this is important to get. Please don't miss this. I'm going to throw a lot at you today. Watch this. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now stop for just a second. If the fig leaf covering that they made was sufficient, why are they going into further hiding? Does that make sense? I mean, what, think. Of, put yourself there, right? You're covering the news story or whatever for the local news, and you're checking this out, and all of a sudden, there, Nate, we're going to get to him in just a second. Or, see, that's a little teaser. It makes you interested. keeps you awake. I offered coffee to a lot of you, and you didn't take it. I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep you awake. So, as soon as they sin, eyes are open. Oh, my gosh, you're naked. Oh, my gosh, I'm naked. Now we're covered, are they? They weren't convinced of that. Get this. The covering that they came up with on their own, they knew it wasn't sufficient. Why? Because when the presence of God comes their way, they run. See how I flow. And they... It just seems silly, doesn't it? Why, wasn't the, why, why were the leaves not enough? Why wasn't that enough? Why wasn't what they came up with to rectify the problem they had got themselves in enough? Why well, no, we just haven't used, get this, we haven't used enough created things to cover ourselves. This wasn't enough. So let's go find some other larger created things in order to hide from. Adam and Eve are the only people that have gone from the moral declaration of very good to spiritually dead. See, their problem is, is they are in a state of deadness. Now, does that mean that they all stopped living and flopped on the floor? No. What does the Bible tell us that spiritual deadness is like? It is a separation from God. They're still animated, still have blood flowing through their veins, heart is still pumping, but they are now living in a means that is apart, detached from reality. I mean, is, is God, you know, it says he's walking through the garden in the cool of the day, but I don't see that he's dragging a billy club along behind him. Do you see that? Are they afraid that they're going to get whacked because of it? No. Notice their own sin has caused their fear. Now you have two things in your handout, and I wanted to show you this. And notice that it's cut in such a way as to where you could probably trim just a little bit and tape it on the inside of your Bible. And I want you to see something very interesting. Notice what you have in the span of time. In eternity past, you have the creation of the universe, and you have a perfect creation in the past. But because we all have our handy-dandy Grace Bible Church pen on us, right? We all do. See, you hold it up. Good job. See, I don't have it because this doesn't have pockets. My <laughs> sin doesn't have pockets, so I couldn't put it on there. But notice this part that overarches with the cross in it, this present evil age. I want you to do me a big favor. Above that arc right in the middle, I want you to write in big letters, all capitals, the word abnormal. Abnormal. This is so important for you to get. Abnormal. And here is the reason why. If you talk to the evolutionist, they will tell you that once a species dies out, winds down, gives out, and it just gives way to newer things, survival of the fittest, stronger life forms as we perpetuate on in this existence of chance. That's the whole idea. Everybody familiar with that? But if that's the case, death has always been normal. Now, let me ask you this question. Is death normal? How many people have been to a funeral recently? Is death normal? You ever look at this and you're like, you know what? It's okay. This sits right with me. The fact that this person died tragically, I have to be okay with it. That's just the way it is. 
Does everybody see how that attitude or that mindset about where everything began or how everything started diminishes the quality of people's lives? Does everybody see why things like abortion and that type of mindset become reasonable and acceptable options of birth control? Everybody see how crazy our world has gotten? But here's the interesting thing. If we know at the very beginning that there was a time when sin did not exist, it did not reign, death was not present, and because of the choices that Adam and Eve made to introduce this, where does sin come from? Within. Sin comes from within it. That is our origin spot for sin. If it comes in in that direction and it was never here before, we see that at the end and through the power of the cross, it is one day dealt with. This means that there is a future existence when there will be no sin. Now we have a word for that. It's called hope. That's our hope. Because what it tells you is that death is not normal. Death is not supposed to be here. It is okay for you to feel upset at a funeral. It is okay for you to grieve when someone passes away. Why? Because death is simply a physical reminder to all of us of the repercussions of sin. It's never pleasant. It's not supposed to be. It is abnormal to everything that God structured. He did not create sin. He did not create death. Everybody see how that works? Very important. Very important truth to get. And so in doing that, look back at the scriptures here. I love it. Verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now this is interesting. You might not see this unless your text has a little indicator there of what it is. But everybody see where are you? Does your Bible or your little notes tell you anything specific about that word, you? What is it? Somebody raise your hand. Tell me. It's singular. Who do you think God's talking to? Adam. Responsible party number one. Isn't it interesting he doesn't say, where are y'all? <laughs> I mean, that's what it says in our versions down south, right? But. Where are you? Now, did God forget where Adam was? Was the tree just that big? It's like, you know what? The fig leaves weren't going to get me, but that tree, good one, guys. Wasn't for sure. Notice he's not calling out Marco Polo, Marco Polo anywhere, right? Ollie, ollie, oxen free. That doesn't happen. It's not time to come out. Why do you think he says this? Doesn't it seem odd that God is calling out to Adam saying, where are you? Did he fail in being omnipresent, everywhere present? Did God fail in being omniscient, knowing everything? Did he know where they were? Yeah. Does God just like to play games? Is that what it is? No. What do you think he's trying to do when he does this to Adam? You think he's trying to go, Adam, where are you at? What is your position now? Look at what you're doing. I mean, let's be honest. Doesn't the Holy Spirit convict us of our sin this way? What are you doing? Where are you going? Why did you touch that? Why did you click that? What in the world were you thinking? Where's this? Where is what I gave you, and why was it not suitable enough that you felt the need to set it aside and to come into this? Do you realize how I see you now? Probably pretty startling here. So he says, verse 10, he said, I I heard the sound of you in the garden. I love it. I heard heard you coming. And I was afraid. When I heard you coming, I began experiencing an emotion that I had never felt before. Anybody ever been afraid? I mean, genuinely afraid. We're talking like haunted house afraid. Serious afraid. Afraid bad news afraid afraid fear they've never known it i I appreciate that he's being honest here i was afraid and look what he says because let me give you the reason god why i was afraid i was naked and i hid myself 
Notice that Adam takes the time to reinterpret how he thinks God will be able to look at him. I'm hiding in hopes that you don't see me. Why? Because here's one thing that Adam knows, even though now he has been separated from God. He knows that God is who he is accountable to. Does everybody see that? Out of all the opinions that would have mattered on earth, I hid because I was scared of your opinion. I didn't want to see, I didn't want you to see me because my shame was great. Now let's stop there before we move forward in the narrative and let's look at a little section that I've written in here for you about how has their image and likeness been corrupted by sin? Some important points I want you to see because if you have been collecting these, you can go back to probably number three, four, five, somewhere in there, and you're going to find this exact same list of how we are in the image and the likeness of God, but it's all going to be before sin entered the picture. What does it look like now? The mind. Number one, the mind is defiled. Have you ever been there staring off into space, daydreaming, and then you freak yourself out by what you were thinking. And you're saying to yourself, because you never say it out loud, good grief, I can't believe I was thinking that. That's so horrible. And it's probably got something to do with driving and other people, maybe, right? But you're thinking something and you're like, oh my gosh, by the way, y'all are terrible drivers here. Man. Man, I'm driving the speed limit. I even got it locked in on cruise control. We're doing just fine. <laughs> Is that what? <laughs> this show, this, yeah, yeah, it's her fault. <laughs> this just goes to show you how defiled your guys' minds are. Because notice what happens. You immediately start playing the victim right? That's what it is. Minds are defiled. Moral and ethical judgments are made apart from a divine standard. Let me give you some phrases. I don't think anybody's saying this anymore, but has everybody heard YOLO? Everybody heard that? Y-O-L-O. You only live once, which is terrible theology. No, you don't only live once. You live once, and if you didn't accept Jesus, you're in the lake of fire. Deal with that one. You never want to say it that way. But that's a reality. If you don't know Christ, you better hope you only live once. How about the next one? If it feels good, do it, right? Do what you want. This is usually everybody between the ages of 15 and 27. That's, every, that's when everybody loses their minds and is just like, oh, I'm just finding myself. You are right here. Deal with you, right? You don't need to find yourself anywhere. You ain't out there, I promise. I have wonderful grammar. Responsibility and accountability are exchanged for victimization, blame shifting, and excuses. There's always a reason why I shouldn't live up to a standard. This is why you should be very leery of modern day psychology and psychiatry. They're pulling all their stuff from people like B.F. Skinner, Sigmund Freud, those guys are crackpots. If for no other reason that they operate apart from an almighty God of which we are accountable and responsible. See, I don't need to know what they believe about certain things. I just need to know one thing. Do you operate in a fear of God and his standard of truth? No. Crackpot. It's real easy. It's real easy. So when you deal with this, this is why, well, the reason why that you struggle with this problem right now is because of what your dad did to you whenever you were six. When he spanked you for kicking the dog, it was bad. So therefore, it's not your fault, it's this fault. And it trickles down. You know what it does? It keeps everybody free of conscience. I don't ever have to feel convicted about anything. And we wonder why people can commit such heinous crimes today that we read about on the news and we see in the newspaper and those types of things. Why is it? Because this has been seared. It's not there anymore. It's a result of sin. Pummeling forward. Number two, feelings. Everybody loves feelings, right? Subjective over objective. Or just like Satan, we looked at him, loving vanity and it eclipsing your sanity. That's the idea. Feelings rule our decision-making. 
Now, let me do this, and I'm telling you, I could sit down right now and just preach the rest of the sermon on this topic, but I'm going to wait till we get there, okay? It's a lot of restraint. I'm exercising the spiritual gift of self-control. <laughs> this is most clearly seen in the refusal to, say it, church, forgive. If you've got somebody right now, for some reason, that you are not forgiving, this is because your feelings have trumped truth and you are operating in unbelief. It's that clear. It is a result of sin. Unforgiveness is sin. And it destroys people and ties up people and suffocates people into an existence of bitterness. Dangerous. Dangerous. Number three, will. God allows us to make decisions, but these decisions are ruled by sin and self. Self is the authority. I do what I want to. Because we know best. Do you know everything? No, I don't know everything. Therefore, I don't know what is best. I better be looking to the one who does know everything. That way I'm making the best decision possible. Self is the authority replacing a fear of the Lord. Number four, the body. Death is now the body's promised end. This occurs by disease, accidents, murder, or simply by giving out. This is the existence we're all going to meet unless the Lord comes and raptures us off this earth. This is now the end. Whereas Adam would have never died, being in perfect harmony with God, now this is a promised existence we will all meet. We will all come to this point. We will all meet our end. Everyone, save the Lord Jesus Christ, is in sin. Born in it. We all come from those two people. Has everybody heard what's going on in North Carolina right now? Is it Charlottesville? What's going on? White supremacy marches and people are protesting and the next thing you know, some guy decides he's going to get in his Camaro, which should have told you something automatically, and drove it into a, a, a bunch of protesters, killed one person, injured a bunch of others. What do you think's motivating that? Well, sin, yeah. Sin and Satan, yeah. Safe Sunday school answers. Yeah, that's true. But you think it's got a lot to do with emotions? I think it's got a lot to do with the corrupted will. We think about the mind. I think the mind's got some things that they're affirming is true that aren't really true? Probably. Now, we know the end of the body. One guy died from this. What's wrong with people? Does anybody know how the racism problem can be solved? Genesis chapters 1 and 2. We all came from who? Adam and Eve. Period. One blood. Do you realize that, and let me look through here. It's mostly safe. All us white people, if we want to be all exclusive like that, all us white people are related to all black people and all Hispanics. And you realize we're all related? No one's better. No one's any better. But see, racism has been fueled by a corruption of the mind and not thinking how God has laid it out. This is where you came from. Well, I don't believe that. I think that my color of skin is better than this other person. Corruption. Corruption has set in, if that's the case. Back to this. So now when we look at the Scriptures... He says, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. In verse 11, he said, who told you that you were naked? Who revealed this information to you? Did someone come along and open their mouth and blab and let this go? Was this God's best kept secret or something? No, it wasn't, it wasn't that God was trying to keep anything from them. But he was setting them up in such a way as to where they never had to worry about any of that stuff. Look what he says here. Who came along and told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Now, before you read on, what should Adam's response be? Let's, let's do that. Yes, yes. yes, God, I am wrong. You are right. My feelings got the best of me. My emotions overcame me. It wasn't even that great of an apple compared to everything else we've been munching on this whole time. But what did Adam do? No, 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 no. Yeah, he did. But he got up on the curb and he looked. Here comes the bus. 
And the bus started coming, and he said, Eve. (laughs) Right? And husbands, don't play like you're not guilty of doing this. True story. Whenever we lived down in Evansville, we would periodically go and stay with my wife's parents. Go out there, spend some time away kind of thing. They lived about 30, 45 minutes away. And in doing so, we came strolling through, and I was carrying in our bags, and I looked over, and I was like, oh, banana. I was pretty hungry, so I picked up the banana, and I ate it. Put the pill in the garbage can, went on about my day, no big deal. I come back through a little bit later, and my mother-in-law goes, hey, Jeremy, did you eat that banana? (laughs) What should I have said? (laughs) Yes! I allowed my stomach to get the best of me and it came up and it ruled me as my God and it drew me in and I... (laughs) Gone. I'm sorry. Does anybody want to know what I said? (laughs) That would have been a better... Excuse me, what I said. But I got up on the curb. And I looked for the bus. And I said, hmm, maybe Beth ate it. And let me tell you, immediately I felt like this. Like you don't even know. I could feel the Holy Spirit grabbing a hold of my heart going... Man, and I like dealt with it for about six hours. Yeah, you want to you want get inside my head, man. This is how life goes for me. And so we're upstairs getting ready for bed, and I grab her hands and I go, "Baby, I got to confess something to you because <laughs> it's killing me, man. I can't go to sleep." And she's like, "Why? Why? What is it? What? Are you okay? You okay?" I'm like. I ate the banana downstairs and I told your mom it was you. (laughs) And she goes, why did you do that? (laughs) Which is exactly what God was asking me this whole time. And I said, I don't know. And then I did have a reason because I'm stupid. (laughs) And I think she agreed. And so I went downstairs and I told my mother-in-law, I'm sorry. When you asked earlier who ate the banana, it wasn't Beth, it was me. You know what was terrible about that? She looked at me and she goes, oh, honey, I don't care. I was just curious where it went. (laughs) Humility. It's a good dose. But notice that Adam and Eve's situation being thousands of years old is not too far removed from how we deal with life now. It's really not. The only reason why you laugh at my story is because you've been there and you've done that, right? So verse 12, the man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Who's he blaming? See? See? Good job, you got that. Observe, observe, observe. Why is that? Because when the bus came, was it really Eve that he was throwing under there? I mean, she went, right? But she followed who? God. Throwing God under the bus. Now, pause for a second. Does everybody see the goodness of God in this verse? I want you to see it. Let's read it again because you might miss it. The woman whom you gave to... Be with me. You know, my lover, who when I saw her, I said, whoa, right? And I was so excited because you said in your perfection, it's not good. And then you custom crafted her for me and brought her along to me. And I started saying all kinds of Hebrew stuff that I didn't know what was going on. But it's her fault. And ultimately, if you wouldn't have made her, 
you might be out from under this too, but God, really, you're guilty. Does everybody see how corrupt and how it doesn't take much, does it? Just a little bit of pressure. Just a little bit. Notice he says here, then God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, my bad. Is that what she said? Oops. No. What does she do? Let's pass it on. The serpent deceived me and I ate. Eve blames the shining one that she was having a conversation with, right? But it's his fault. Now, here's the thing. Is she telling the truth? Did the serpent deceive her? Did she eat? Yes. Did he make her sin? No. Where does sin start? Within. Everybody get it? So watch this. The Lord God said to the serpent, who he deals with first. And I want you to pay close attention. This may seem kind of weird to you, but go with me on it and think, okay? Think. Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock. Stop for a second. Have the livestock been cursed? No. So how can this serpent be cursed above all livestock? Is God lying? Everybody see the problem here? Everybody see this? Sometimes we just read through this, especially when we're in Sunday school, and we're like, oh, yeah, cool. Snake doesn't have legs now, and that's our conclusion. That's not the conclusion. Does everybody see that we're dealing with something more than just a serpent here? The livestock are not cursed. But yet, here's what he's saying is, since this is the case, I'm going to make you lower than dirt. That's the idea. Do snakes eat dirt? Isn't that what it says here, though? Look what it says here. On your belly you shall go. That's where we think that the snakes had all their legs fall off at that time, and that's why they slither on their belly. And dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Snakes don't eat dust. Livestock have not been cursed. So what is a better understanding of this? God is making a pronouncement. What was Lucifer's position? Wasn't he an angel? Wasn't he a guardian cherub? Didn't he have a throne? Wasn't he in some exalted form? Doesn't it seem like that he had some sort of pinnacle above them, but yet was far, far, far away from the creator who made him? Isn't that where he was? And didn't he fall from that because iniquity and unrighteousness was found in him? Yes. And what God is saying here, I'm going to curse you even lower than what you thought you could be. I'm going to make you a public spectacle. Now, if you read Isaiah 14, uh, Ezekiel, oh gosh, where'd it go? 28, thank you, Pastor Steve knows it. Why am I even up here, right? (laughs) Ezekiel 28, and don't we get the sense of the idea of his exposing you before kings, making a public mockery of you for all to see, and yet there's no kings on the earth at the beginning? Does everybody see how this all connects together? Satan is going to be highly, publicly, and eternally embarrassed over this one event. Why? Because he put the worm out there and led humanity into a sinful situation. It's disgrace. It's not just in the here and now. It's got far-reaching implications that are going to be seen. Look at verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Imagine taking both of your fists and pounding them together, knuckle to knuckle. When I think enmity, that's what I think, like that. Constantly butting up the head, constantly being at odds with one another. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Now pause. Some of your translations say his seed and her seed, right? Now here's the thing. Are we talking about that there's going to be snake people? Is that the offspring of Satan, the serpent? No, it's not what we're talking about. These offspring are demons. The idea that they are falling in line and having the same allegiance to unrighteousness of which Satan has. So notice, we're... We've got to get beyond this cute little green snake up in the tree somewhere. We've got to get beyond this idea and realize there's something much more and spiritually alive that is going on here. So notice, it'll be between your offspring and her offspring. Notice the idea of spiritual warfare being right here. It says, he shall bruise your head. That's a death blow. Bruising the head, crushing the head. Some translations say he will crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is what is known as the Proto-Evangelium. It's known as the first gospel that was pronounced. This is the first inklings that we have that a Savior is going to come on the scene. And this is all they know about Jesus yet. They don't even know his name is Jesus. 
They just know he's going to come in and he's going to crush this opposer's, this adversary's head. Now watch this. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And all of God's women said, thanks a lot, Eve, right? (laughs) Now, I talked to a lady one time. This may be you. I'm not asking for hands because this is weird, but let me just share it. I talked to a lady one time who made it known that when she gave birth to her child, her first child, she did it without an epidural. She went full on natural the whole nine yards. And I looked at her with great distress in my face. And I said, how did you feel? And I've never seen anybody so real in their life. I thought I was going to die. Thanks a lot, Eve. Because that's just how serious it is. Interesting. Now, does everybody remember the pre-fall institutions that we looked at? Marriage, family, labor. Everybody remember that? Marriage, family, and work, labor. All before the fall. Does everybody realize that this attacks part of one of those institutions? It changes it. This whole reproduction thing of producing forward a family has now become troublesome. It's become inconvenient. It's become odd. It's become different from what it was created, and it's a repercussion to remind. Why is childbirth painful? Because it reminds you of the seriousness of sin. You think I feel real comfortable up here in this? No, but I'm trying to remind you of the seriousness of sin. It is serious. We'll get to him in the box later. Notice the next one. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, ladies, does that mean you're going to go, baby, I love your eyes. You're so cute when you walk. You got that nice style. You ain't got all your teeth. I still like it. (laughs) Is that what that means, your desire will be for your husband? Is that it? What does it mean? Do we know? Let's put it in some interesting terms, and hopefully I won't get any hate letters this week, okay? It means that y'all ladies are going to be constantly seeking to put on the pants in the family. But you are going to be unable to because God has chosen the men to lead the home. If you ever wonder where that struggle comes from, let me paint it for you. Not that I've had any experience in it. But let me paint it for you. It's the whole idea. And honestly, she's not bad at this at all. It's great. Well, it's got to get done. And obviously, he's not going to do it. So I guess I'm going to have to. And so what happens? It gets done. (laughs) Who said that? I'm going to take you out to lunch. (laughs) And then I'm going to leave you there while you're eating. (laughs) It gets done. But here's the thing. If she leaves her roles and responsibilities to go do what is lacking because he's not upholding his roles and responsibilities, what gets done about her stuff? Nothing. Does everybody see where that's a problem? You're not really fixing anything. You're usurping a role and an authority that's not supposed to be there. This is a result of the fall. Does everybody realize that this attacks the institution of marriage? Marriage family right here, the same one. You are now going to have problems. Whereas before, these were flowing, free, no problem, good, full of grace, expounded in love, bubbling over with joy and happiness. Now there's going to be friction. And it's not pointless friction. See, this we get all this unhappiness in our marriages and we stop and we don't think about why is this happening. We, we want to place the why and root it in on the person who we're married to. That's not why. Trace it back. He tells us. This is the reason this is going to happen. 
because she is going to seek to get this done. She's going to seek to overthrow this position. Ladies, I don't know where you're at in your marriage. Be his cheerleader. Encourage him to lead. Sometimes that's what he needs is some encouragement. You're like, sometimes he just needs a slap in the face, right? Well, try encouraging him instead. We're so quick to slap, so slow to encourage. I'm going to get in tons of trouble. Let's move on. Verse 17. (laughs) And to Adam he said, and watch this. (laughs) The scriptures are unforgiving. Because you've listened to the voice of your wife. Now, husbands, this has not just become your favorite verse that you've memorized already, okay? (laughs) Keep it in context. Keep it in context. He listened to the voice of his wife over who? See how that works? Because you took her opinion over truth. That's important. Wives, do you add something amazing to the relationship that could not be there in any other way? Absolutely. Wives are a source of wisdom and discernment like we've never known before in a large part. Okay? Understand that. More valuable than gold, silver, jewels. Amen. Praise God. But if what they have to say trumps God, better to do what God says than what they say. That's what he's getting at. So notice this. Because you listen to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, of which, and notice how God does this, of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles It shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Labor has now become difficult. Marriage, family, labor. All suffering... Because the idea was, I think I'll do what I want to do instead of what God has asked me to do. And God reminds them, remember, I commanded you this. Now look at those last few. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. There's your introduction of death. Here's what's going to happen. It's not just that you have been spiritually separated from me, guys. It's that you will now meet physical separation from me. They've never known death before. Nothing ever died. Now, Verse 20, the man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. Notice that he's still able to exercise dominion in some capacity. But now here's where it gets really, really interesting. Pay attention. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Remember what we talked about? What did they provide for themselves? Fig leaf underwear, right? Did it work well? No. And even they knew it because they further hid, right? So they knew that whatever covering they're trying to muster is insufficient from the get-go. It won't work. And so they hide as well. Notice that God plays the role that he's always played. In fact, if you look at your sheets I gave you and look on the back, I actually wanted to highlight this for you in the very middle of the page. God saves because he is, as he has always been, man's provider. See, everything that Adam and Eve tried to come up with and everything that we try to come up with is becomes nothing than religion. It becomes a checklist. It becomes rules. It becomes requirements that have to be lived up to. And what it is, is it's all sufficient, no matter what it is, to ever gain an acceptable position before God. It's still fig leaves. It's still hiding behind trees. It's still inadequate. It does not suffice. And so what does God have to do? We provided sustenance for the man. In fact, he spent five days preparing the earth before he ever put people on it. He got the nursery ready before he ever brought the baby home. Why? So they have everything that he needs in order to function and operate according to what God has said. Now watch this. We're going to come back to it. It says here, verse 22, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. 
Notice this. People now know good and evil. Let me line this out for you. It's at the bottom. I'm not going to spend much time on your sheets. But this is the shift in the dispensation that we're dealing with. The dispensation is an economy of how God chooses to run the world at any given time. There are four phases in which a dispensation runs. Number one, a responsibility is given. Do not eat of the tree. Number two, a failure takes place. They eat of the tree. Number three, a judgment is now warranted in this situation because of disobedience. God has now judged them by these various curses against them. But number four, there is always at the end of every dispensation an access, an availability to grace. There's always an availability to grace. And so what does God do? He spares their lives and he clothes them with someone else's clothing that he provides. Very important to see. Now we move into the beginning of the second dispensation, the responsibility. They now know good and evil. People are now to operate according to their conscience, knowing what is good and evil. Now watch what he says here. This is God, the Trinity, talking. Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand... And take also of the tree of life. Everybody remember the tree of life? Made every tree in the garden. There were two trees they pointed out in chapter 2. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They've already been with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they never touched the tree of life. That tree is still there. Now that they've eaten of this, and now that they are separated from God, and now that they are in a state that is of sin, it is now sinful. If they were to reach out their hand, notice what it says here, and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And does everybody have like a dash, a long dash? What are those called, English people? What are those called? Long dash? Okay, long dash. That's what we're settling for. But the idea here is stop the sentence because if you were to continue and give the results, they're too horrific to think of. Or we might say perish the thought if we're super dramatic, right? The idea is, is that if they were to reach out and take of the tree of life, and they are already in this sinful, depraved, diminished state separated from God, they would eat of this and they would live in perpetual separation. Does everybody see that? And notice what the Trinity is saying here. Don't even finish this sentence. That is a horrible existence. Why? Because it would render Adam and Eve unredeemable. They could not be saved. Serious. So how does God keep this from happening? Look what it says. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim, big scary angels, and a flaming sword. First mention of the word sword. Why do you think he put the sword there? To be ornate? To kill. That's why he put it there. Swords were meant for killing. That's really important to help us discern the rest of the scriptures when we try to interpret them. He put a flaming sword that turned every way to guard it, the way of the tree of life, so they could never take of it and eat. God would just as soon have them killed right then and there if they tried to reach out and grab of that tree and eat. Why? Because then they would live forever in sin. Does everybody see why that evolutionary mindset of death is always constant, it's normal, it doesn't work? God won't allow it. Now everybody back, back up. Verse 21, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Is this a good depiction of sin? Let's do a good job. Maybe. Some of us. We get it? You guys are excited about this. So what if we pictured our sin in a different way? I told Mary I was going to do this, and she was working on her computer, and I came in, and I set it on her desk, and she turned around, and she goes, oh, my. And here's a great thing. Tom's been giving me a hard time all week. I said, you wait till my sermon. I'm going to get you. I like that he just jumped. Yeah, good job. Is this appealing? 
It's not even Halloween. And there's something about this that's just, I mean, what if it was real? What if it was dead? What if you kind of, I mean, it's even got red eyes. (laughs) Art's like, I see it. (laughs) But what if we were able to open him up a little bit? Does that capture sin? Does this do a good job? Because this is what Adam and Eve ended up with. They sin. Oh my gosh, my eyes are open. Yeah! Quick! <laughs> He'll never know. <laughs> Does it work? No. If anything, the covering's incomplete. No matter what you try to do, there's not enough leaves in the world to cover sin. Get that. Everything I'm trying to supply is insufficient. Everything I'm trying to do is say, God, accept me on my terms. Accept me on my terms. Please, 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 please. And God says, no. What you need is sufficient covering. Had there ever been a death on earth? Who deserved to die? Adam and Eve. I mean, they sinned, right? The wages of sin are death. How many sins? It only take one. It only takes one to get your life. Does everybody see there's a high cost in sin? There's a high cost that we run this crazy eternal credit card account with God. Up, 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 up. And we charge all of our misgivings and all of our wrongdoings. And we think that he's just going to overlook it and be cool with it. And he's not ever. Even when we try to hide it, it always finds you out every time. So what does God do? And I'm sure it was right in front of their eyes. I know a lot of you work with animals, cattle, and that kind of thing. Somebody offered to take me out to watch a, a cow get killed. Who was that? Hoffman? Was it? Yeah. He said, you want to come out and we're going to slaughter a cow sometime. I'm like, I don't know that I would enjoy that, but okay. You know, Pastor Steve had gone. He was like, yeah, it was pretty deep. I'm like, Death's just not my thing. I like eating it, but not watching it. It's okay. They'd never seen death before. What do you think it looked like for God to kill these animals in front of their face? See, that's the interesting thing. We, all, all we think about is, oh, okay, they needed something more, so God actually made them something, and then we get all these cavemen pictures in our heads about what they probably look like. But I think the real significance that we look past is the fact that something died so that they could live. That's the point. It's the whole idea of the first time seeing blood on the ground. In fact, if you go to the Creation Museum, there's a very interesting depiction that they've done with wax figures you round this corner and it's adam and eve like this just just tears streaming down their face and you can just tell they look like they've been beaten down emotionally and they're just crying out and you have these two animals that are laying on this rock in front and the skins are missing and all you can see is muscle and blood and eyeballs and all this stuff laying around everywhere god was painting an extremely clear picture this is what your sin does You ever heard an animal scream? Imagine. At that moment, imagine. And probably what was more horrific is that God turns around and he takes the covering. And he says, this is sufficient. This covers all of it. This is something that I have provided and specially made so that you can now be acceptable in my sight once again. Does everybody see how he sets the stage for Jesus? Are you covered? I don't know everybody's heart. I'm still so new. Somebody looked at me and said, hey, are they new here? I said, I have no clue. I'm new here. I'm just trying to welcome everybody to the door. (laughs) 
but I don't know if you're covered. I don't know what you've done in your life to try to merit some sort of accept me God. But I tell you this, if it's anything that originated with your hands or in your mind or from your heart, God does not accept it. God accepts a covering that only he has provided. He only accepts perfection. Perfect covering. Are you perfectly covered? You say, well, maybe. How do I get perfectly covered? And it's real simple. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has everlasting life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Have you passed from death into life? Do you have eternal life? You get that by one way and one way only, and that is believing in only the covering that Jesus provides by his blood. It's the only way. Now, regardless of where you're at, everybody has to deal with that question. Because if not, you go into eternity like this. See, that's, 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 the, that's the crazy thing about people who are lost and know the gospel and still continue. Their sins have already been paid for. But they have not been redeemed. Does everybody get that? When Jesus died, he died for the sins of the world, right? He's our propitiation, our satisfying sacrifice, and not ours only, but for the sins of the entire world. The offer of salvation has been split wide open for everyone to come. Everybody can get covered. I mean, isn't that the essence of grace? Grace is never just kind of enough. Grace is abundantly more than you can ever handle. Jesus didn't just die for everybody on this earth. He died for everybody on this earth millions of times. And yet with that knowledge of the forgiveness of sin, people continue on. Are you covered? Now, I'm not an altar call guy. I'm not looking to do that necessarily. I'm not about riding people's guilt off into the sunset either. But I think it's an honest question we need to come to. Am I redeemed? Am I covered? Am I saved? If that's the case and you'd like to have more questions to clear that up, let me know after worship. I would love to have that conversation with you. If for some reason I'm busy, just butt yourself in there because that conversation is more important than whatever one I'm having. Let's pray. God, thank you for the redemption, the covering that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord who takes the repulsiveness of our sin and does away with it who alleviates our burden, who removes our guilt. Father, the horrible thing about religion is that we're constantly trying to conjure acceptance before you. Even as saved people, we're trying to earn your favor. Father, change our minds today. Help us realize we have all of your favor. You are for us. You are for us who are in Christ. Father, if today is the day of salvation for someone, that they would realize that these filthy rags are never going to move forward. It will only drag us down. Thank you that you cover completely, sufficiently, perfectly. Thank you, God, for Jesus. It's in his name we pray this. Amen.